hay would be stacked up along pretty much to the ceiling. So you climb up all the hay bales and this get up on top. This barn and back is and forth. fascinating. You've had an interesting life. Your childhood was storybook like. I have. You're very fortunate. I believe me, I know it. And I know you've worked hard for all your success in racing, working hard at the bank all day, come home and do this all night. Do you ever just do nothing? Like, hey, oh, yeah. let's just. Oh yeah, I'm enjoying I, that more and more. <laughs> I just don't see it. I don't see where there, nothing comes into your world. I mean, to run a successful uh, championship race team, the winningest team in USAC history and you know, the bank job, the 40 hour week and all this. I don't, I don't know how you keep up. I don't, we're, there's no time for nothing. Okay. Again, in, in 2016, I retired from racing. Uh -huh. I told my dad, you know, I took the president's job at this bank. He did. And he said to me later that year, um, would you come back and, and just do the little 500 for me in 2017? He said, uh, I got you a good driver. And I went, who's the driver? And he said, Tony Stewart. And I went, <laughs> so I came back for one race in 2017, did the little 500 with Tony, and, and we ran third. Went back to my wonderful retired lifestyle. Uh, then um, ended up uh, 2017, no, 2018, he said to me, Rob, you know, every year for Father's Day, you got me a feature win. And, you know, he was still going down to Lawrenceburg with our local team. He wanted to continue racing, even though I wasn't going to be in it, but he couldn't do the work anymore. He was in his mid-70s. Yeah. So he would go to Indianapolis and basically lease a race team, all their equipment, their personnel and everything, and bring the sponsorship dollars to them, and it would be called Hoffman Auto Racing. And that's what we've been doing for these years since then. But he was still racing down at Lawrenceburg on a local deal with Brady. So he said to me, uh, you've always given me a feature win for Father's Day. And, you know, I don't have a crew to go down there. Would you just go down there and, you know, you don't have to do any of the work. Just do the setup on the car. And I went, okay. So we went down there. And that night uh, we ended up winning the feature with Brady. Mm. And uh, about two months before he died, uh, we were cleaning up the shop for our fish fry, and he said, uh, came across that trophy from Lawrenceburg. He said, Rob, do you, do you want this trophy? It, it's, you know, the last trophy that you and I won together, and I thought maybe you wanted it. And, yep, that's um, it's probably my most prized trophy yeah. from a local race. Oh, of course. After all it the has wins to be. that we've had at all the big that races. That has to be number one. It is number one. Yeah. It, it occupies a special spot. As it should. Yep. That's a cool story. You got along well with your father. We did well. Because not every father and son does. You know, I've had, I've had my issues with mine. <laughs> uh, but uh, you guys got along okay? Well, it, we did. Uh, there were times in the shop that it looked like Paul and Polly from Orange County Choppers. <laughs> and, you know, we'd be yelling at each other. That's, all, that's all part of it, though. We, we had tremendous love and respect for one another. And yeah. we spent a lot of time together. Oh, uh, gosh. Either up here or on the road. And, you know, when I, when I talk about, you know, the, the relaxed lifestyle I live now, I'm so thankful for that because my long-suffering wife um you know she's been such a huge you, part you, of my life you, you deserve some sort of award she or does. something i'm not she sure really what that is for putting up with me and all the racing and everything mother of the century here you know for however long i used every vacation day i had from the bank to oh. go to a race oh my god because but we never got to take family vacations unless it was something that was associated with going to unless a race. Unless it was Eldora Speedway. It, hey, you want to go to Eldora well, again? Know, <laughs> right. Racing on the national scene with the USAC was actually pretty nice because one of the races they held was a Silver Crown race at Disney World. So I got to take oh, the family cool. to Disney World. We'd go to Richmond. We'd end up in Virginia Beach. We went to sure. Pikes Peak. You we, had to create vacations along the way. Along the way. But yeah. they were only like one or two days. And you sure. know, it wasn't a true vacation. No. When I retired from racing, we started going on vacations, real vacations. And oh, my Lord, what a difference that is. Do you enjoy, did you enjoy it? Oh, I love it. We went, uh, the, I think the first one we did was... Do you feel like you're living again or something? Or A I mean, little bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm experiencing I'm, other things. We went to Southern California, rented a motorcycle, and I rode Pacific Coast Highway with her. Oh, really? It That's was cool. Wonderful. It really was. That is so cool. But, uh, you know, things like that that we never had the opportunity to do before, we're taking advantage of that. So That's really I'm, neat. I'm perfectly fine with doing what I'm doing right now with 
you know, Brady running uh, the race cars out of his shop out there in Union City, Indiana, or uh, Ohio, and um, doing a little 500 car. And I hope Brady's my driver again this uh, coming year because he does a hell of a job there. And then uh, starting, the the, starting the kids on the quarter. The quarter midget. Midget. yeah. Yeah, That's I'm, neat. I'm perfectly fine doing that in the banking and still enjoying the other aspects of my life my lovely wife yeah yeah you know some of these trips we'd be coming home from uh wisconsin or pennsylvania and those are such long rides all nighters and oh we roll into the shop about 6 a.m i and go home take a shower and go, go to, to the work bank. Uh, <laughs> yeah i can't do that as much oh, anymore that's punishing yeah that's punishing so we'll go take a little tour of the house she's got her own stuff here as far as incredible her Dad, uh, when he was 18 years old, uh, he was working a summer job before going to Notre Dame on a football scholarship. And he was involved in an industrial accident. A paper bale fell off a forklift and fell onto him and broke his back and oh. he ended up a paraplegic. No kidding. Now, they told him at the time that he probably wouldn't live to be 35 because paraplegics just didn't live that long back in those days. Uh, he was a stubborn guy. He ended up going to Xavier University and getting his degree. Uh, he married his high school sweetheart. That's so cool. Fathered four kids. Wow. Drove a car every day. Put hand controls on a tractor so he could bush hog. Uh, taught them how to change their oil and do maintenance on their car. She said he made me change my oil. Oh, yeah. Oh really? oh really? Yeah. So you had to change oil? Change your oil, rotated my tires. So, that's another little interesting sidebar. He actually, we saw McNicholas rockets out there on the. Yeah, the on chemistry. the back of that car. He was the chemistry teacher at McNick, and taught my father high school chemistry. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, how oh. far back we go? That's kind of scary when you think. No, about it. I think it's so cool. Yeah. Do you, any idea who? lived in this house in the 1700s. What I was told was it was a land grant to a colonel from the uh, Revolutionary War. Wow. So this is the kitchen that I literally I grew up in. I ate a lot of meals in here. And you did. We have no air conditioning in this house. Um, you hot water heat. And uh, you just love to sit on those radiators in the cold winter months when you sure. come outside. One of the things I've always wanted to do is go back inside my childhood home. I mean, uh -huh. someone else owns it, so I can't. But I, I want to go bang on the door and just ask if I could come in for 10 minutes. And, I mean, so, so I mean, the attachment you must have to this home well, must I be only, pretty incredible. I've only lived in two places in my entire life. This Here, house. And the one you're in now. When she and I got married, we bought a house, and we are still in it 29 years wow. later. That's so cool. So this is our dining room. And you see, we gosh, it's a we huge will stop dining this room. place in Thanksgiving. Oh, that's Special cool. Special occasions, birthdays, the fifty-fourth running of the Indianapolis Five Hundred. Nineteen seventy. Yeah. Alan, sir. If I had to guess, this is probably an Ezra. Yep, Ezra Brooks. Alan, sir, the winner, the Johnny Lightning car. See how thick the wall is here? Oh my it's God. Stone. That's a oh. This is a stone wall. That's more than a foot thick. Oh yeah. Oh. Fireplace in this room. Yeah. Fireplace in that room. And the bedrooms upstairs. Is this a 1700 section? Yep. Wow. God, if these walls could talk. Yeah, there's an overhead picture of the farm. Okay. Old fireplace. This, I think, was probably the cooking fireplace, if I had to guess. Is this part of the 1700 this section? Is 1700 section. I mean, look, these old base, they don't make baseboards like this anymore. They're nearly yeah. a foot tall. Hmm. But look at that, look at the size and thickness of that wall. That's the interior wall. That's an interior wall. <laughs> and it's all stone. Uh-huh. Oh my God. By this time, this was all enclosed. Look at this wall. I can't get over this, how <laughs> thick that is. <laughs> That's how you can delineate what's what here. I mean, this is a stone castle from the 1700s. That's amazing. This area is really cool for a family gathering. Oh yeah. And then some. Would it be impossible to, to pick a driver over the decades for Hoffman Auto Racing that might have been one of the best? Or You've had so many. I mean, I don't even know how you'd okay. pick one. 
That's really putting you on the spot, isn't it? It is putting me on the spot, but I can tell you hands down, the best driver that I have ever worked with, by far, bar none, Kyle Larson. <laughs> well, no surprise there. If you worked with Kyle Larson, he's the best driver in America today, possibly the world. Well, I knew that though in 2011 when he drove for me. He drove for me five times. We won three, finished second once, and um, destroyed a car. Wow. So, he's yeah. amazing, isn't he? There, he was phenomenal. He's, he's unmatched in the world today, I don't think. He absolutely I think. is. And I, I knew that. I mean, I worked with Jeff Gordon a little bit. I worked with Tony Stewart. And when they were the same age as Kyle. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, by far. Yeah. However, that being said, probably the second best driver I ever worked with, Brian Clawson. Ooh, and good good choice there. I, I discovered he was a good driver because when we went there to test, he was talking about trying to cure something by making an adjustment that hadn't worked in, for me in the past. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll do that. I changed the panner to rod height on the rear. And he went out there and he went faster on the stopwatch and he came back in. He said, yeah, that felt better. I said, well, hang on a second. I want to try a little bit more. And I went and put it back to exactly where it was. And he went back to exactly the old speed that we were at. And he came back in and said, that didn't feel as good. And I said, okay, I've got a driver that really gives good feedback, knows what he needs, and he's making it happen. So from that point on, I trusted whatever he was telling me the car was doing. A lot of times drivers can tell you one thing, but it's not really what the car needs. And I've definitely done that to drivers before where told him I was going to make a change and went the opposite way and we ended up winning anyway so <laughs> it's <laughs> pull the fast one there well sometimes you got to but because a driver you have to learn which head. which drivers you can really truly listen to oh absolutely and or yeah or when you have to really just listen to yourself well you know drivers will get it into their head that this is what needs to happen if you don't give it to them that it's not going to be good and it, yeah you screw with their mind then yeah if they so. think they got what they thought they wanted when in fact it was just the opposite all is good all in is victory good. lane they, they don't need to know that ever <laughs> no <laughs> that's why i'm not saying what drivers i did hey, that to. Do, you th do you think <laughs> boy i really want to know now <laughs> who was that um i mean is racing going to survive i mean as we one day switch all to electric i don't know when and how fast that's coming but we're certainly leaning in that direction i mean sprint car racing seems to be alive and well specifically on the dirt i mean you're certainly not hurting for cars but are we going to live into the future looking 10 20 30 years down the road racers true racers are true racers and it doesn't matter what the form of propulsion is they're going to be out there pushing it to the limit. So if they are electric cars, they're still going to go race them. They're still going to go race them. It won't be nearly as thrilling. Just yeah, like I a V8 doesn't sound nearly as thrilling as an Offie. But... And I can't imagine not hearing either. Just the screeching of the tires and the, yeah. and the, the wind whine, noise. The whine of the engine, yeah. of the uh, motor. Sure. You know, uh, it, it could certainly happen. And, you know, I, again, I don't fear so much for that as I fear that our generation uh, that we're bringing up of political correctness and wokeness oh my God. and everybody gets Please. a participation award. I, I fear more for that because when you give out the same results or the same uh, prizes to everybody, no matter their effort, no matter how much they desire it, no matter how hard they work for it, that just destroys racing. It takes racing is pure. I, you know, I don't give a crap what gender a person is, what color there is, what they, it, I don't care. If they can make my race car go fast, they're going to be sitting in the seat. And it's the same way that I work with the bank. I don't care what color they are, what their gender is, what anything is. It's, if I loan you this money, will you pay me back? That's all that I care about. Because I've got to run a business, and my business, the goal is to make money for the business and keep it out there and keep it going. The goal with the racing is to win races. If I have to put somebody in the car to satisfy 
somebody else's agenda, that's when I stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, I did run into Loveland before I yeah. came to you and looked through the town. It's a neat little town. It's a, it's a great little town. I loved it. Uh, it I was a lot smaller it. back in the day. I can only imagine. I mean, Did you? Is there one racing memory for you that would stand above all the others outside of that cool trophy from your from your dad that you guys kept? The one that always sticks with me from Indy cars was my first time over the wall to change a tire on a pit stop, and it was under green flag. Uh, we didn't qualify very well, and of course you pick your pit stall by how you qualify, and we were up almost the last pit on pit road so up near turn four and i went over there and i got the gun in there and i hit it and the wheel nuts spinning off and i see out of the corner of my eye a car coming off the track and onto pit road and they didn't have pit road speed limits back then so he was still running probably 180 when he went past me and it was aj foyt and he passed within about 10 feet of my feet at 180 <laughs> miles an hour and when I got back over the wall after the pit stop, I remember for like three or four minutes just sitting there shaking with the adrenaline. <laughs> that, was a, that was a huge one that's always been impressed upon me. Uh, the Mopar Million was a great one. Um, you guys won that? No. We, <laughs> we were actually leading it with about five to go, oh, ten no. to go. And Dickie Gaines was driving for us. Yeah. Dickie Gaines Dickie almost Gaines. won the Mopar Million. Oh my God! He left. He left just about that, that much, too much room on top, and Holland Shield got between. Jack. Yeah, uh, between him and the wall. Did Dickie finish second? Nope, because the next corner he tried to get him back and overdrove the car and slid it, and uh, Stevie Smith uh, dropped underneath him, but I, he did finish third. I will bet that's still haunting him today, Dickie. Well, that was by far his biggest paycheck he ever got. For well, I know, but a million bucks. That was, that was 120. Well, the winner didn't get a million. He got 500 or 250. I yeah. can't remember. But yeah, it's they still sp- a big oh. number. Yeah, they spread out the purse. Yeah, it was uh, uh, third paid 125. Wow. Yeah. Back so in that, the old USAC days, I remember the owner got 40%, the driver got 40%, and often the chief mechanic got 20%. Is there a formula you guys work with or... Yeah, my uh, dad would uh, always pay the driver 40%, uh, car owner would get 60 or no, and then I'd get 10% of that uh, total, so he car owner really got 50. Uh, if the driver won the race, they got 50%, mm. and that's how we've always Kind of like a bonus, yeah. bonus money. Well, yeah. You'd Incentive. Want them, you want them a little incentivized for those wins. Oh, you mean like everyone doesn't get the tallest trophy? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how many victories you have overall? I mean, is that a number? It, it is a number, and we actually kept track a while back, but I know it's over 135 USAC wow. victories now, I think. USAC sprint cars or across uh, the board? was Sprint mi- cars. Sprint cars. Wow. Yeah, that does that include so cool. um, silver crown or midgets. Right. This is the actual rear end that was in it. And Eldora, when he flipped. This is so from the, this is this pieces is from the apart crash. from the Kyle Larson crash? Yep. That is, that is, that's the actual right rear tire. Um, and you're that's, gonna, that's what's left of the front axle. Oh, plenty to work with there. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so what are you going to do with this stuff? Is this, there, is, are these pieces and parts valuable because Kyle Larson crashed this car? Well, I mean, what we've been told is that if you have actual pieces from the car, then even though they're crashed and they're damaged, it serves to give the, uh, what is it called, provenance of the car, um, you know, the history to make sure that it's actually the car. So we kept a lot of the parts and pieces. A guy expressed interest in acquiring this car. He bought the frame and had it repaired. So he's got the frame. He's got the frame and he's going to uh, finish the restoration. So this is kind of interesting because the, I look at some of the stuff and I, I think to myself, well, we'll just throw that away and get it out of here, but uh, not necessarily so because Kyle Larson crashed Kyle this car. Kyle Larson crashed it. <laughs> that yeah. makes it, that yeah. changes the ball game. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good but, question. But it, it is absolutely, this whole box came off that car. Wow. He crashed this at Eldora? Oh, look it up. <laughs> he has said that that is the hardest crash he's ever had in his life. Is he a good kid? Nice kid? Nice, good man? He was such a lit, polite guy to work with. And, yeah. you know, again, I haven't talked to him in 
long time. eight years. Yeah. So it's been yeah. a while. But he was such a nice guy back then. Yeah. Just a true, pure, raw talent. I mean, he makes everything go fast, and he wins. It doesn't matter what he gets in. He's probably going to win yeah. eventually somewhere. Hey, put him in a Formula 1 car. I'll bet you he'd be You know, I said that. that I said that earlier this year. I actually got a little soundbite interviewed Kyle Larson at the little midget track at Indy. Mm-hmm. And I and I, I did say that. I mean, I, I believe that if we put him in a Formula One car, he'd be badass there too. It'd take him a little bit to learn it. He'd figure it out. But he'd figure it out quickly. He would figure it out, yeah. yeah. He, he's amazing. I, I found out that it wasn't so much my talent that got us his wins. It was the fact that I just gave him a car that had four wheels pointed in the same general direction. <laughs> and he did it from there. He's really that good. <laughs> With reverse stagger. <laughs> he didn't care that's okay i guess that's the question i didn't i forgot to ask was where did the number 69 come from i, I that'd be a sin if i left without that one <laughs> true that true that um we actually had crashed an in, uh, indy car and we had to buy a replacement and we bought a car that was in pristine condition uh it was all polished up and everything and it had the number 69 on it and the reason why it had the number 69 on it was the guy that we bought it from was trying desperately to gain penthouse sponsorship. And he took it to the uh, American <laughs> Adult this Cinema too much. Awards. <laughs> yeah, and so that is why we had 69 on that car and we just left it ever since. Oh my God. Which has caused a lot of embarrassment over the years. Well, of course, the sexual uh, reference here. Well, yeah, and the, you know, my... <laughs> <laughs> Little Joe uh, Saldana was driving that for us cool over in story. England, and they said uh, uh, BBC came up to him, and he kept on missing shifts and tagging valves, and we'd uh, have blue smoke coming out of there, so they nicknamed him Smoking Smoking Joe. They came up there and shoved the mic in his face, and they said, "Smoking Joe, our, our viewers want to know: um, Does the number sixty-nine have the same connotation in the colonies as it does here?" <laughs> 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 Joe, of course, being very shy, and he got all flat. Oh, go ahead and ask the car owner. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know how, what to what yeah, to come back to that one. Come back to that one. Oh, but yeah, okay. it, it's it's a good number. It, it's something that is now ingrained in our history. Oh my God! Yeah, I don't think when I think, you know, it's like when you think of NASCAR, I think of the three and Dale Earnhardt. You know, and when I think of USAC sprint car racing, the first number that comes to my mind is sixty nine. Every time. I've been looking at that Hoffman race car forever. I don't. I didn't know all these backstories, but <laughs> I've been watching that race car for decades. Oh, uh, we, we've only scratched the store, uh, surface <laughs> on backstories, well, but that's good. I'll have to come back for part nineteen. Then. There you go. There you go. <laughs> that that's so cool. How how long have you had that number? When the sixty nine? When how far back is it? Nineteen seventy six. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, that's your trademark. It is a trademark. It really is. Time, yeah. yeah, that's so cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Don. Yes, sir.